What's up y'all, it's Shuffle, and today we're going to talk about the hidden stats in Darkest Dungeon. So if you wanted to know what things like the hit cap are, how crits are calculated, what the heal cap is, scouting chance, all of that type of stuff, then you are in for a treat. That is what is happening in this video. As always, before we get started, if you enjoy the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, leave your thoughts down below in the comments, and then make sure to check out the description box for Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon, which is all cool stuff with their own perks. Probably the most important thing we need to talk about on this list is accuracy. So with accuracy, there is a hit cap of 95%. That is why even if you have 150% on an attack like Finale that can get up to like 160, even though you have that much accuracy, you will never go above 95%. You may be thinking the reason for this is because the enemy always has a 5% chance to dodge, and it's actually the complete opposite. You always have a 5% chance to hit no matter what. This also applies to the enemy. So because of this, when the game displays your chance to hit an enemy, it goes up to 95 because it is always assuming that you have that base 5. There is another player side buff for accuracy which is pretty cool that I didn't know about until I started researching for this video, and that is that accuracy goes up by 4% every time you miss after the first time. So if you have a very evasive enemy like spiders and you're low level, and you just constantly keep missing, every time you miss your accuracy goes up by 4% until you hit them. So that's kind of nice. It does prevent you getting completely RNG'd out of an entire fight, but honestly, on the other hand, the fights in this game go so quickly that it usually doesn't matter, but it's still nice to have it. The next vitally important stat is speed. So you always see your speed modifier on the character sheet, and sure, you'll be thinking, okay, I have 10 speed, I should be going before anything that has like 6 speed, right? That's not always the case. So the way speed works is it rolls a die between 1 and 8, so a chance between numbers 1 to 8, and then it applies your speed modifier on top of that. So if you have a modifier of 4 speed and you roll a 6, congratulations, you have 10 speed for that round. If you ever have to retreat from a battle, your base chance to retreat starts at 70%, and for each failure to retreat that you have, you get a bonus 5% chance to retreat after that. There is a healing cap in the game, so your bonus chance of healing cannot exceed 100%. This means things like Hippocratic or Trinkets or other buffs that may come up cannot exceed 100% effectiveness, but there's also a secondary cap, which is healing received, which also goes up to 100%. So between the two of them, you can actually get your bonus healing up to technically 200%, which is pretty cool. Another point about healing is that heals have specific crit rates. You cannot change these, they cannot go up, and they cannot go down. A single heal has a crit rate of 12%, while a group heal has a crit rate of 5%. Any healing crit that you get doubles the effective heal value, meaning if your normal heal is for 5 and you get a crit, then it goes up to 10. Speaking of critical hits, critical hits are pretty cool and interesting, and the way they are mapped out is not readily apparent. Undoubtedly, when you've seen yourself get a critical hit, you go, wow, that hit pretty hard comparatively, but here is how a crit is calculated. It's pretty simple, so you have your normal crit rate of like, you know, 20% or whatever, and then you got a critical hit. The way the game maths it out is it takes the maximum damage value listed that you can do, and then it multiplies it by 1.5. You could say it just adds 50% to it, but if you just want the easy math, then you can just punch it in your calculator and hit 1.5. For example, if you do 10 to 20 damage listed on your ability, and you get a critical hit, then you're going to hit for 30, because that is 1.5 times 20. Crits are interesting because not only does everyone get their own unique, specific, very cool crit buff in the game, but the farther you get into the game, so like higher level, when your damage ranges get bigger, they're not as compact, so it's not 5 to 9 or whatever anymore, it's like Leper who goes up to like 13 to 26, then crits get way better than they were previously. The reason for this is because since your damage range gets so big, a critical hit guaranteeing at the bare minimum a max roll is already fantastic, and then you add a bunch of damage on top of it, so crits get really strong and they snowball pretty hard. The final thing I can say about crits is that if you get a crit heal, you'll heal not only the double HP amount, but also you'll heal four stress, so that's pretty cool. And if you get a critical hit on a weapon swing, for instance, or an ability, whatever you want to call it, then you heal three stress on yourself at the minimum, then you have a chance to heal 3 more stress off the rest of your team, with each person having a 25% chance to receive that stress heal. Virtue and Affliction is something that comes up quite often as a question. Your base chance to get an Affliction is 75%, which means that your base chance for a Virtue is 25%. These chances change depending on the level of your hero, so if you are lower level than the level of the dungeon, so for instance if you are taking a level 2 character into a level 3 dungeon, so a veteran mission, then your chance is 5% lower for Virtue per level of the dungeon in terms of difference. 
And now that might be a bit confusing, but as long as you're just subtracting 5 from 25 for each level that you are below the dungeon, then it's easy to figure out. You will always have a 1% chance to virtue. This only comes up if you're like level 0 in a level 6 dungeon, which you probably aren't doing, but it is there. Also of note with Virtue is if you do get one, then all of your resists that are not death blow, trap, and disease go up by 25%, which is pretty freaking nice. The Virtue cap is 95%, but honestly that's pretty out of reach for most builds and most intents and purposes. But getting up to 50 or 75% or something like that, or 70, whatever it is, is actually pretty reasonable. You just stack Virtue trinkets and then get Irrepressible, which is a 5% Virtue chance quirk. Each attainable virtue does have its own set of specific bonuses and act outs and all that, which is too much to talk about in this video, but if you want to go look at the wiki, then you can do that. So whatever your chance to not get a virtue is, that is your chance to get an affliction. Afflictions are very dangerous and most of us are probably very familiar with them at this point, but just know that afflictions lower all resists except death blow, so this includes disease and trap resist by 15% on top of lowering your max HP by 10%. That is before we get to all the other specific affliction modifiers that exist. Afflictions can be reset mid-dungeon, so if you're able to heal enough stress to get the person back down to zero stress, then the affliction will go away and you won't have to deal with it unless they hit 100 stress one more time. Virtues are a bit different. They lower your stress to 45 upon activation, but not all the way back to zero. And then if you get your character up to 200 stress afterwards, they don't heart attack like they would with an affliction, but instead they reset back to zero stress and lose the virtue. So that's pretty cool. This only comes into play if you're in like really high stress situations like Endless Harvest, or if you're playing Torchless, sometimes you wanna get your character that's virtued back to 200, just so they're not back up at like 100 or 40 or 50 or whatever it is when you leave the dungeon. Just for the sake of being thorough, I'm gonna talk about Disease Resist. It has this mathematical formula of being 32 minus 33 times your Disease Resist, and that's your chance to get a disease and that's like a minimum 5%. Honestly, I never remember this, and I just don't care enough about it, but it is there if you actually do care. The one thing that is of note with Disease Resist is that it doesn't scale the same way as other resists do because of how this math comes out. And this also has an interesting interaction with Holy Water when you finish missions. So if you get to the end of a dungeon, and you know how you can sometimes get diseases at the end of a dungeon, if you have any holy water left in your inventory, start throwing it on heroes that don't have Crimson Curse because that raises their disease resist, and yes, this does impact that math check that I just talked about at the end of the mission. You're not guaranteed to not get a disease by doing this, but it does help, even though I still have gotten diseases despite doing this. Another fun fact that I did not know until I did research for this video is that you cannot get a disease at the end screen if you're a level 0 or 1. After that, it's fair game. Leveling up has a couple benefits besides raising your skill and gear caps. When you level up, your resistances all go up by 10, except for disease and death blow. The rest of them go up by 10, which is pretty nice. And the other important factor about leveling up is that if you're lower level than the mission you're doing, not only is your virtue chance lower because of that, you also start with bonus stress upon entering the dungeon. A hero receives 20 stress per level difference upon entering the dungeon. This is like we talked about before with Virtue Chance. And then they also receive 25% bonus stress per level difference as well. Which means if you're taking incredibly low level heroes into dungeons, they're going to afflict very quickly. For scouting, once you're inside of a dungeon, your base scouting chance is 25%, and if you're up at Radiant Light, you get a bonus 15%, so you're up to 40. For every successful scout that you get, you have a 50-50 chance afterwards to get a Critical Scout, which is the type of scout that scouts two rooms instead of one. The Critical Scout is the only way you can find a Seeker Room inside of a dungeon. The spawn rates for Seeker Rooms is as follows. In a short mission, there is no chance of a Seeker Room. In a medium mission, there's a 50% chance. And then in a long mission, there is a Seeker Room guaranteed, you just have to scout it. When a hero is in town, not engaged in any other facility, they heal 5 stress per week that passes. Once you get the Puppet Theater District, this goes up to 15 per week. Once you complete a mission, your chance to get a positive or negative quirk has quite a bit of math involved, so I'm just going to flash the graphic on the screen so you can pause the video if you want to. Long story short, if you're trying to avoid negative quirks, make sure your stress is as low as possible when exiting the dungeon. The final thing we're going to talk about today is bosses. So if you don't want any spoilers on bosses, at least in terms of mechanics, then make sure to pause the video or skip ahead now. The way bosses spawn is not random at all, it's actually very formulaic. So most of you probably know that the boss spawns in the room that is the furthest away from you. That's pretty easy to understand. You just look, if there's a room that's five rooms away and there's one that's four, the boss is going to be in the one that spawned five rooms away. 
it does not matter how long the hallways are, just how many rooms it takes to get to the boss. So what if two rooms are the same distance away? This is when it gets pretty interesting. So when there are two rooms that are the same distance, the boss will spawn in the lower of the two rooms. That is the first priority. So what if two rooms are the same level? So what if there's one that's three rooms to the left and one that's three rooms to the right? It's gonna spawn in the one on the right because the way the pattern goes is it's the furthest amount away, then it's the lowest one, and then if there are two that are equally far and equally low, then it will pick the one that's on the right. It is incredibly rare in my experience that all three of these come into play at the same time, but usually there's two, so most of the time if you do have that kind of situation, then you're picking the one that's either on the bottom or the right. So as long as you're picking bottom or right before left or top, then you're fine. The final thing about boss mechanics also ties into speed, where it doesn't matter how fast your characters are, if a boss has multiple actions per turn, meaning if they get two or three or four attacks in the turn, then it does not matter how fast your characters are, they can be negative 50 speed, the boss will get one of its actions before the end of your turns. So if you have four characters and the boss has two actions, even if you're plus a thousand speed, however hyperbolic you want to get about this, all of your characters will go except for one, and then the boss will get one of its two actions, and then you will get your final turn. Then obviously if the boss has three or four actions, then stretch this out accordingly. Might be saying to yourself, Shuffle, why do I stack all the speed then if the boss still gets one turn before the end of the round when my characters aren't done? It does seem like it's the game being unfair, but this is actually another form of player protection. The reason the boss gets one of its turns before the rest of your turns are finished is so the boss can't get two hits back to back and kill one of your characters without you getting a chance to do anything about it. So because of that, this is actually something done for the benefit of the player, even though it doesn't feel that way at first. Alright, all right, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you're thinking down below. Let me know if there's something I missed, because there are a lot of stats in the game that aren't explicitly stated, so it's pretty tough to wrangle all of them together. As for upcoming videos, I keep getting asked about a farmstead guide. I am honestly not that familiar with farmstead, so I'm going to have to request help in terms of getting the knowledge to put that one together, but it is something I'm looking at. I also want to finish my character guides if I can. I'm not sure, but I'm going to try my hardest. And then besides that, there's me the normal stuff like viewer runs, maybe some team of the week, as well as some other topics that I don't remember off the top of my head. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.